So we have a very specific topic today, which is deep brain stimulation and the communication issues related to it. So it's inside uh, something else. So it's it's really specific. And obviously, if um, if you don't have DBS, and people usually have um, questions regarding it, so hopefully we can take all something from it. So we're gonna we're gonna start um, by just focusing on on how often these issues might be present, and then thinking about what exactly are we talking about? What what could those communication changes be? Then focusing also on there might be symptoms of Parkinson that also indirectly or directly influence communication, so we also want to approach those. And then with a very practical sense of what can we do about it. But before we dive into that topic specifically, we want to put this into context. And that means that if we, if we think about how uh, Parkinson evolves, uh, what we know is that as time passes and maybe as an estimate of five, seven years, people might feel that the medication does not uh, last the whole interval that you are usually taking it in intervals, right? And so you might feel that the effect is, is reducing somehow. And this is the moment where the doctor is common, most commonly will speak about this option of using deep brain stimulation. And we will go into what it is. But so we know, we understand where does this come from. Now we know more recently uh, people are being proposed this type of intervention early on, maybe earlier on than, than uh, when it started being used for the first time. But this would be the most common trajectory. We start feeling more difficulties, the medication is not making so much effect, the doctor wants to be able to keep the, your status completely continuous, so obviously this becomes an option. But there's many other options, okay, just approaching this one. Yeah, I think there was actually a change in the FDA uh, ruling on it, the way it was regulating it after its initial uh, approval. And so it was uh, a situation where, where they were approving it initially for a different kind of tremor called essential tremor in the late 90s. And then in uh, 2002, you had the first approach, the, the STN, and then 2003, you had GPI. And all, all that deep brain stimulation really is, it's a and uh, electrodes inside the brain that are providing a consistent current and it and basically triggers the circuits in a certain way that mimics the effects or the benefits you would get from medications. And again, it's a very effective approach. Again, back in the day, it was more of a situation where later after you've exhausted a lot of other options, but now there's been a growing body of evidence. And you'll see doctors talking about a lot earlier for the possibility of maybe providing benefit for a longer time or getting uh, uh, optimized medication routines that you can maintain and let you be more active. And so it's about a quality of life at this point. Um, there are pre three primary uh, uh, manufacturers that we see in the marketplace. The first one, the initial one that was there by themselves for many years was Medtronic. And Medtronic uh, came through probably their innovations they were doing with cardiac pacemakers. It's kind of like a pacemaker for the brain. And they came with the first set. It had four electrodes. It was very straightforward. Uh, but more recently, they've innovated a closed loop stimulation. And what that allows is the electrodes that are providing the stimulation are also acting as a sensor and listening to the brain waves and then changing the amount of stimulation based on the brain waves. So it's kind of a, a that's why they call it a closed loop. And it's, it's interesting. Um, it, it has a lot of potential benefits for providing the right amount of, of, of energy at the right time. And it's kind of cool. Uh, Boston Scientific is the next manufacturer that came along and their major intervention uh, innovation was current steering and current steering allows for the electrodes to be shut down preferentially on one side or another side actually I believe it's in threes and that allows you to provide stimulation to one side or another. Uh, Abbott is the, the third one and it's the most recent uh, addition to the field uh, it was originally put out by another company called St. Jude, but now Abbott's taken the ball and run with it. And they also have current steering, but their uh, primary innovation, uh, innovation is that they have remote programming. And so um, provided your doctor has the proper licensure, you can actually get into kind of a Zoom call situation and they can log in through the device and change the simulation. And that provides a lot of benefits for people who may be more remote. 
So when you're talking to your doctor and coming up with a decision about whether you're going to do this or when you're going to do this and how you're going to do this, uh, this will be part of the conversation and there will be different reasons why they might choose one or another. We're not really going to get too much into that. Just to say that there are the, these options and different ones do different things based on your needs because we know Parkinson's is so highly variable that maybe you'll pick one over the other. So when you have Parkinson's and you have all these symptoms that you're trying to address, um, you're hoping that this DBS is going to correct a lot of this, but you'll find at some point that there are certain things it's not better for, and then there's also things that maybe it should have addressed, but it didn't address. And that's usually due to, to either maybe someone who wasn't the ideal candidate for the, the surgery, or maybe they didn't um, have the right uh, placement of the leads, or they didn't have the proper programming, which we'll get into that a little bit. Um, sometimes, though, I think it's really important to understand what it can and cannot do, and therefore not have unreasonable expectations. But balance is a really good example. This whole program today is on changes in communication because it's a very common issue. So again, it's not expected necessarily to improve communication, and, and those are the unreasonable expectations. Another thing that's important to realize with all treatments, whether it's surgical or it's medication related, is that disease will progress over time, and that's going to have an influence on how much benefit you get with the, the device over time. Yeah, I wanted to share that one of the first things that uh, people do uh, when, they, when the doctor here in Portugal, the doctor recommends them, they think about, start thinking about DBS, is they, they either call me up or they ask me, they asking me about, I would like to talk with someone else, right, uh, that has done DBS. So that means there's a lot of concerns that probably are not approached in that moment of the consultation and probably questions that people have that sometimes they might not be so open to ask the doctor, right? And, and so this motivated um, a study that we did through uh, Parkinson Europe, which trying to understand some of the needs around and concerns that people actually had about uh, undergoing um, such a surgery. And these were the top three that came out. So the, what people were most concerned about was the possibility of DBS not being effective, of course, because if we're going to go into something we want it to work. Having side effects that people hear about, and this is where the communication is, something that among people with Parkinson is um, highlighted or spread, people talk with each other and they identify that this is something that happens with some frequency and that scares people, especially if you are someone that really depends on your voice. Um, another angle was not having enough information, so highlighting that we need more information to be able to take uh, decisions and then obviously what scares us most is the moment of the surgery and surgery complications. So it was interesting to have a perception of what are people afraid of when we think about these type of surgeries, because obviously the health professional is always going to be very, uh, you know, you're going to improve this, 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 but how it goes, how it happens during the, the day that you do it are, are things that are, uh, that cause a lot of fear. And this obviously justifies the validation of us thinking about this talk which is, so one of the major concerns that people usually report to us is they're really concerned about their communication. And in my clinical practice, when I'm working with someone with DBS, I almost have this perception that either your gait is very good or your talking is very good. And that has changed. So when, when initially, so I've been working with Parkinson for some years, and now I've seen that the technology has evolved in such a way that I feel more hopeful that, uh, you know, when people with DBS come to physiotherapy is because unfortunately something did not go so well, right? So that means I'm always biased to receiving situations that are, uh, that went less good. Um, and this would be one of the situations that I'd see, either affects the gait or either affects the speech. Uh, so hopefully you can take some information here that might be useful uh, no matter where you are in your journey with Parkinson. It's interesting you say that because that's exactly my experience in the past was that either your, your speech would be somewhat affected, but your gait would be dramatically improved. And I even had people that had settings for, like, I'm going to be sitting down at a table talking with folks, and that still happens too, but I think it has changed a little bit, especially mm -hmm. with current steering. So uh, well, let's begin with the first layer of topics because these all kind of intertwine a little bit. How often do communication issues occur with DBS? 
And I'm going to point to a really great study. Uh, this is Dr. Suboy, who's Japanese by, by uh, nationality, but actually was at the uh, University of Florida. So he was at Michael Oakland's clinic down in, in Florida and published a number of really great articles in this area. And they broke it down into different phenotypes. And so um, quite a number of people, a quarter of them had no discernible changes. And again, uh, this is a physician, but the speech therapy program down in, in that particular clinic has had a long history going back to like Jay Rosen back in the 80s. They, they have great, great speech research out of this clinic. And so I think they probably captured great information and realized there was real no impact on the DBS on there. Then there was another quarter of the people who had stuttering. So fluency change is what we call that. And um, when I practice, um, if I see someone appearing with fluency issues after DBS, it usually points me towards a, a programming concern. Um, then there's people who have breathy phonation, and that's not quite as core, that's 16%. And that um, is something that happens a little bit in Parkinson's already, so this could just be an exaggeration of that. And then the last two, a strained voice type and a spastic dysarthria, and I won't really get too deep into one versus the other, but again, that indicates to me when I see someone showing up like that, that there's stimulation that's affecting a part of the brain that is causing that issue, and that, that's what, what it comes down to. And so when you look at this study, which had a fair amount of people, you know, just about 100 folks in there, it's um, a quarter of them had no influence, a quarter of them had a changes that were probably related to stimulation that was changeable with the, with, the, with the programming. And then you had these other kind of dysarthrias, which were probably also affected um, by the stimulation and also correctable with, with either treatment, but probably, probably by changing the stimulation. Now, there was another study that came out, and this actually came from a nice survey from a group that I don't believe is around anymore called STNDBS, and um, they published this as Dr. Wertheimer's a neuropsychologist. And what they did that I think was so smart in this study is they broke it down to people who were younger versus older who had DBS who didn't, and then people who had had Parkinson's for a lot longer versus uh, people who had had it for just a, a medium amount of time. And now this was published about a decade ago, so that's before I think the FDA changed their, their approaches to this, and people were usually considering this something much later in their, in their diagnosis. But if you look at this, I won't get into the numbers here. It's not really that important, but what's important to notice is that without, without uh, fail, the people who have DBS have somewhat and significantly somewhat higher numbers of concerns about their communication, higher uh, uh, indications that they're not communicating as much, and even higher indications that they aren't uh, socializing as much and they're getting a little bit of social isolation due to changes in their communication after the DBS. And that's not universal, and, and there are some factors that you would expect. You know, people who are older and have had Parkinson's longer is a little more severe, but it ain't interesting enough, not much different than people without the DBS. But it does point to the same thing, which is there are some changes in communication. Now, I would love to see this survey. I was talking about this when we were writing this, this together. I'd love to see this survey today because I think it's changed a little bit. I think it's yeah. a little more. I think what's important we can also take from these studies is the, how do I know if I have speech problems, right? Because some, you won't perceive it. Usually it's the family that identifies these problems. So by uh, thinking about these questions and trying to reflect on them, I think it's a way for people to also be empowered in terms of knowledge and knowing how to identify. So as you can see, to what extent do you think other people can understand you? That makes you stop to think, okay, are people asking me frequently to repeat myself, right? And sometimes it's not, most common we think about soft voice, but it's not that. When I'm working with someone with DBS and I can understand this, these difficulties, it's like the air is in, so it's the, it's like the voice is not projecting, right? So it's very common uh, characteristic of the talking. I can always identify someone with DBS just by the talking. And so I think it's useful to look at these questions and to also take them with, you know, and think about them. Are you communicating less because of your speech problems? So are you talking less? which could obviously mean a lot of things, but I think it's also a nice question for us to, to see if we're talking less, if we're socializing less, if we're um, hesitating more. And sometimes with people not understanding you, if you're in public or if you're in a kind of a, like a bank or, or, or you're in a grocery store, they're not going to be like, what, I can't hear you. You know, they're going to be a little more like, they're just going to be leaning in a little bit more. They're going to be trying to cut the noise. They might even do one of these kind of things. So it's not, 
uh, always as cut and dry. But if you're noticing that, that's probably a change in your communication. This is this is something that's a little bit outside of the scope mm -hmm. of this, but I think that's why uh, working with an SLP before your your DBS and and maintaining that relationship should be should be part mm -hmm. of the process. So specifically, she was talking about how she can hear it. I, I believe that. I think there are definite characteristics. We want to get into what kind of communication changes can occur after DBS. And to get into that, let's look at this graphic that, that really highlights all the pieces. You know, you have the inner circle, which has to do with what we call the motor speech. So that's the movement-related components of speech. So that's the teeth and the lips and the tongue and the breath support and the voice production. And that can be influenced by uh, electricity affecting one of those, those fibers, basically the cortical bulb or fibers. And that's one area where it could be directly stimulating a structure that is responsible for providing movement-related information to those structures. And then on the outer circle is a whole bunch bunch of, of components related to cognition and language. And particularly, attention is a very big component. You got to be able to maintain attention to keep your train of thought. And so sometimes people talk about word finding issues or changes like that. So this is where that would get into this. And then um, memory and word finding and, and the pragmatics. And again, it's a little bit different because it's not going to sound like traditional Parkinsonistic quiet speech. It's going to be more uh, strained slurry. Um, sometimes you get this situation where you really feel like you have to shout in order to get it out there because you can't, you're, you're working against resistance. And this is just some, some, some statements people have. So I, I use the phone less. That's a good one because phone is not a great transmission medium. It's already got some noise in the signal. And if you aren't speaking perfectly, that noise in the signal is going to make it really difficult. Um, Running out of air, you were kind of mentioning that before, feeling you have to strain to produce the voice. So these are some generic ones, but we reached out to a couple friends of ours that had had P, uh, DBS just to get a little one-on-one -on -one perspective. And we asked them if they, you know, did anything change after their DBS, anything change in their communication particularly, and what they've done to address it. So Ben Stetcher um, is a really kind of a super advocate. Uh, he, he was diagnosed fairly young. I think I was like 29 or 30, quite, quite young, and has a genetic form of Parkinson's and had his DBS at a very, very well-known clinic. And he notices um, that his family has uh, picked up on how much more effort it takes for him to communicate. Um, he, his sister-in-law is a general practitioner, so a physician said that she sound, he sounded drunk. That's the slurring. And slurring is not really a, uh, that's not a hallmark of Parkinson's speech. Quiet speech, breathy phonation, okay, that, that for sure. Effort, slowness of speech, that's very Parkinsonistic. That's not what we're talking about. This is where maybe the vocal folds and the structures controlling speech are being stimulated in a way so that they're not, they're not moving freely, and that's that sound that he's talking about. When the stimulation is too high, he has a tendency to speak a little bit too quickly. And I, I have a friend also, uh, an Australian uh, or an Irishman living in Australia, where that's sometimes he, what he notices is that his speech is very quick and rapid. Of course, he's got kind of a nice rapid pace already, and so it just amplifies that. So it hasn't been entirely resolved. He's had it fairly recently, so he's been working working through that. And so he does, he says he yells. I would say he uses loud phonation. But the difficulties are there, and so he has to push through that. Um, interestingly, he, um, he works closely with a number of physicians, and he, he just wrote a book with a really well-known uh, Dr. Fasano in, in uh, Toronto on a, oh, the, his experience through DBS, and that's why I put a little mention of his book in there, because he's got a great perspective on this and very in, in, insightful as someone living with it. But just to be clear, he had it done. He had it done with a great team. He's working with one of the best doctors for DBS who's been doing it for many years, and it's still not quite resolved. He's still working on it. And that's, that's, that's normal. That's not in, uh, completely uncommon. Mm -hmm. now, Larry comes at this in a much different way because Larry Gifford, who is a, one of the founding members of the PD Avengers that you might have seen their SPARK program last month during Parkinson's Awareness, he's a professional voice user. He's a radio broadcaster and now a podcaster. And so his voice is his personality. He was pretty worried 
that this was going to have an influence, and that, that's, that's a real concern. Um, this is where the current steering really made a difference. So he opted to have placement of leads that have the current steering ability. So instead of having it come all around, they can shut off certain sides of it and provide the current only to where it needs to be. And um, that seems to be very effective. He, he had a little anecdote here that I added. I don't know how common this is, but he did the sleep, the uh, awake DBS. So while he was in the surgery suite, the doctor was talking to him. And they had him use his radio announcer's voice, and they used that to help them tune it so they made sure the leads were placed properly. And once they felt that the voice was ready for the broadcast worthy, as he said, that's when they left it in place. And I thought that was kind of cool. I don't know that everyone gets that treatment, but it was a cool idea. I have the impression that I've had the privilege of going into the surgery with some of the people that I work with. And that is, the I would say, the more traditional would be half of the day is done with the person awake and yeah. then the rest is the person sleeping so I think that's the it started there maybe yeah. now and now it's changing now it's possible for the person to be sleeping through the whole process yeah and, it's, and that's a, those are innovations might that be have more old school method well, they call it like a twilight uh, anesthesia so people are, are not yeah. they're not ready to drive home but they're able to respond and then maybe they may put them a little further under mm -hmm. real a sleep dbs was an innovation that came around about a decade ago and that requires imaging of the structures and then they they basically do these high resolution mris and they're using that to guide them when you're awake i think they're using micro electro recording so it's like two different ways to the same thing and i think the asleep dbs when it first came out we were all a little bit like oh it's brand new but now it's been out for a while so i, I don't i don't think i have an opinion on one versus the other anymore no, it just you know it's good that technology evolves and yep. it, <laughs> we can count on it being better and better yeah it was one of those things where when a sleep DBS first came out, the FDA would only allow it to have be used in individuals that had a high level of anxiety for the surgery, so you'd have to get a humanitarian exemption, but that's no longer the case. It's now, now mm -hmm. surgeons have done hundreds of it, so I, I, again, I don't have an opinion about it one way or another. Uh, Brian is, is another super advocate. We both met him at Grand Challenges in Parkinson's in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the Van Andel Institute. And he had his bilateral DBS in 2019. He had the Abbott as the leads and the Abbott for the battery. And what's interesting is that he was not getting a good experience with the battery. And so they switched out the, the cans, they switched out the battery to a Boston Scientific one, which allows for very granular, you can turn off single electrodes with the Boston Scientific and um, that seems to have been provided some benefit. It's, he's still working on it and he's a really good example of a kind of an advocate that has shopped around and, and gotten the best approach because he didn't get exactly what he needed initially and that's not like, okay, well, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm, this is over. I'm, I've done it. He kept looking and I, I think he said he was working with Dr. Oak and Kelly Foote down there who actually did the very first uh, Abbott back five, six years ago when it first came out. So I, I like his story because um, sometimes you'll get a setback when something happens initially. I mean, that's Parkinson's, that's life, but um, uh, there's always options. There's always ways to look through things, and he did that very effectively. And what, the question that he places about the, finding the correct words. Oh, yeah. This is, upon it. See, we will. This is super common. I'm having a harder and harder time getting correct words together in my brain. Is this DBS related? Maybe. I mean, it's also Parkinsonistic at some level, but the DBS may have an influence. And we'll get into that when we get into the research side of things. But um, it's not directly DBS related. It may be DBS influenced, if I can say okay. it carefully. So um, going through that uh, study by Dr. Wertheimer, um, again, they had people who had had Parkinson's for six to 10 years, and then people who had had it for more than 11 years. And when you look through it, the really common, most common ones, low volume, of course, that's Parkinsonistic too. People without DBS have that. Uh, word finding difficulties, as we just mentioned before with Brian, and slurred speech. Those are kind of the top three. And, you know, the slurred speech particularly, to me, really speaks of DBS influenced changes because that's the one thing that I don't find you come into my clinic, uh, you were diagnosed in the last three years, that's probably not the top symptom. It can happen, Parkinson's can, it can happen to anybody, right? But look, non-DBS 5%, non-DBS 
eight uh, percent for people who've had it for more than 11 years. So it's not a highlight where if you look at the law of low volume, you know, it's almost the same. The numbers are about the same. It's just a little harder sometimes to treat after the DVS. So what we find specific to word finding issues is that um, the tip of the tongue problem is somewhat influenced and particularly um, with what we call verbal fluency. And verbal fluency simply means the ability to name a bunch of words that begin with a certain letter or you could also be looking at items in a category. And again, this is already something that is part of what people deal with with Parkinson's already. So without the DBS, this seems to be the real single area that we can consistently find in studies. This is a review. This is a systematic review. So they went through all the studies that were up to now. This is from 2021. And they found studies, and this is what they noticed, which was a pattern of decline in the verbal fluency, but picture naming was unaffected. Picture of something comes up there or name me what you see, what's happening, the quickie theft picture, these other common tests, that's not affected. And I think that's a really important thing to say because the evidence is it doesn't really have an influence on general cognition or other aspects of cognition. It seems to be focused in this one area very particularly. That doesn't make it any less frustrating. You still need to want to address it, but it is one of these things that we do see and does not seem to, to propagate to other areas. So other things that DBS can influence, um, articulation and speech clarity, surely. You know, and again, if you think about where DBS happens in the brain, they can put the electrodes in one of two places, and one of them, the subthalamic nucleus, is right above the area of the brain stem that becomes the the fibers for providing speech, and then those cortical bulbar fibers become cranial nerves, and they, they innervate the tongue and the back of the throat and the lips and the teeth and all those pieces on the teeth, I guess, but all the other areas. So for sure, if you have stimulation that's affecting that, it could, have, it could bleed into areas and, and cause that to be uh, impacted. Um, sometimes you do see changes in kind of emotional recognition, emotional expression. It's like a social cognition change. And again, um, whether that's specifically stimulation induced or just uh, changes after the surgery because you're getting, it's not like you're taking the medications and you get your dopaminergic rush and you're doing a certain amount of day-to-day uh, of, uh, -day living and then it changes. This is always on and so there's kind of a low-level hum of, of the, the, the stimulation and so that can sometimes have different influences. Um, same thing with changes in facial expression and body language, the facial masking. And then, yeah, again, it becomes a little bit mood related sometimes, although the, the evidence on changes in mood is up and down. It, it's it, like so much research, unfortunately, it's not completely conclusive. So kind of getting into that topic, when you start looking at other symptoms, there's a lot of influence of the psychosocial elements of having Parkinson's and that influences communication. And you can imagine that things to make you more isolated and more socially isolated are going to have an influence on your cognition because you're not interacting as much. Uh, depression and anxiety will make you either less aware or make you focused on whatever is making you anxious and keep you from attending properly. And that's going to have an influence on communication. And this is another uh, systematic review. Uh, and this one, they actually went through and recalculated the data in a meta-analysis. And all that means is that they looked at all the different studies that were coming up to now, and then they recalculated it when possible. And they're saying it's not clear the pattern of anxiety and, and de depression, but it does seem like it does uh, uh, wane over time. Actually, there's another study I was looking at we didn't put in here where an individual with young onset Parkinson's actually seemed to improve some symptoms of depression. But again, if you have symptoms of depression after your DBS, that's a good thing to talk about with the doctor to try to address it as well because it will have an influence on your communication ability. So let's talk about what you can do about it. And this is complicated, right? There's a lot of factors that you can do uh, to address this. So the first thing is knowing how to recognize problems early. And this is a little bit difficult because when you have changes in your stimulation settings for DBS, it may, um, it may take a little time for it to kick in. It might be something where it feels really good 
for the first day or so and then it settles in to what it is and maybe you need a little bit more or maybe you're getting more than you need. And again, Brian uh, talked about this in, in his response when we were reaching out to him. He had a situation right after he got his new, his new Boston Scientific device that the battery, he had two days where they tuned him perfectly and he just called everyone he knew and he had a great, and then it took a little more time to get back to that. So like it was two great days of amazing phone calls and then he noticed that it wasn't working as well and he went back to the doctor and that's the first thing to say. It's like, know when it's changing. Know that it's not in your head and, and don't be afraid to advocate for that. Yeah. And know that you can do something about it, right? Absolutely, yeah. You know, um, so these are the kind of questions you want to ask yourself, and it comes a little bit from that survey with Dr. Wertheimer. Are you socializing less? Are you communicating less? Do you think people are not understanding you? And that can be, you know, your spouse or your care partner, but that can also be, you know, trying to get something done at the grocery store and having them kind of give you the look. Like, they're trying to be polite, but they didn't get it. Um, it can also be very helpful to, to get a little bit of input on your own by looking at either video or recording so, so you can hear it because you can hear it yourself. Um, and then recognize those other factors that could be at play here. So the depression and the apathy, you know, apathy is kind of like a, a depression without the sadness part of it, and it's common. Anything that's caused you emotional distress, um, one thing that does get benefit generally from DBS is that you have better sleep function and that might mitigate this, but if you're still having, um, you know, psychosocial concerns, you should be talking about with the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to, I was going to say, uh, today I was actually working on someone with DBS and he, and he mentioned precisely this is like, I just see that I have more freezing of gait and more, um, when I'm tired. So the fatigue brings on it increases the difficulties that people have with Parkinson overall, but he's um, so he's 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 talking really nicely. I'm I'm completely overwhelmed by the results that he had with his DBS um, because he had so many fears going in. But so what his challenge at this moment is the gait, is the balance, is the freezing, specifically when he's more tired. So it's just identifying that and, and recognizing the moments where people are more at risk and then thinking about strategies that you can use so that you can minimize those risks. Yeah, and it's interesting what you say about the fatigue and that side of it because um, if you do the STN DBS, typically you reduce your meds, but you still take some of them. But if you have the other one, the GPI, typically you don't reduce the medications that much. And so you'll still have some of those fluctuations. The DBS will smooth that out quite a bit. So you can still have, at the end of a cycle, changes that you might want to be addressing. Um, the balance deficits, I mean, this is, gets back to other things we talked about with dual tasks, right? I mean, if you're focusing on keeping yourself upright, it's going to influence your ability to pay attention to someone where you're talking to them and walking and talking is going to be an issue. I mean, other things to add to and that? It's, it's important for, the, for even the family to be aware of this so that maybe in those moments where you can perceive that the person is more tired, that may be reducing the amount of talk that you might have if the person is doing something in the standing position. Um, might be one of the ways for you to reduce risks. And people lead their lives naturally, so it's like now I have to think about everything that I'm doing. But the truth is once it becomes very natural for you to identify these, these situations, then it doesn't become such a burden. This is, this is what people tell me, right? So it's like let's identify ways to make, to reduce risks, to reduce the burden. That's the goal. And that's a, that's a good handy uh, suggestion that if you're someone who is dealing with some balance stuff, if you want to communicate better, it's a good, good opportunity to sit down and not have to focus on the other side of it. I know I'm stealing it from other lectures, but I like it. Yeah. I think, uh, to be truly honest, it's like most of, of the talk, if you're talking about DBS, people will hesitate about talking about complications because, above all, we do not want to cause any sort of fear of the procedure. As I'm telling you, I'm, I'm totally converted. <laughs> receiving people that always and does not go uh, less good I am converted to the benefits that it can have so if the person is really well selected they can have really good effects so um, yeah so th that's important to know that it is considered an effective treatment uh, but we are not discussing oh, more openly like you know but there will be challenges after DBS so it's almost like a person has a new body and he has to learn how to function with it 
So these adaptations in this that they have to be considered and the rehab part of the DBS is very poor at this moment. We have very li limited research going on regarding how non-pharmacological interventions can help after. But we do know now for a long time that there are specific problems that might arise. You know, this the communication is one that's very well perceived among people with Parkinson. The gait issues. The, the instability. So we are aware of it. We don't discuss it too much because we don't want to create fear. But the leading this to an um, to a, um, a positive conversation is that there's things that we can do about it. So it's important for us to talk about it because there is tragedies. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it's a positive message. All right. It's so interesting you talk about how it's changed. But again, back in the day, and I'm thinking like 2010 when I was really working in. Um, we would have people who were going to get DBS and we'd say, let's do some prehab, meaning preventative rehabilitation before you go in. Let's get you dialed into its best movement and best voice. And I'll be honest, I mean, that maybe was a little biased because I would say, well, after DBS, it's going to be much harder to do this work. I don't, I don't think I have that feeling as much as anymore. I mean, still, there are differences. But I think that's what's changed in the past 12 or 13, 14, 15 years. And I remember uh, uh, David Charles down at Vanderbilt doing his, um, doing his uh, research on people who had been diagnosed at three years. And that was really very eye-opening. They, you know, they, they very extensively selected the people, made sure they had very ex ex expansive responses to the medication, which would mean they were very good candidates for the surgery, and they've been following them. And I think... Those outcomes over the past 10 years have been very good. And again, I guess what I'm saying, converted. I won't say completely converted, yeah. but definitely. I'm still from a time that every time I'd be working on something for maybe two weeks with someone, let's focus on this part of your of your gate. And then the person would go into the doctor who changed the settings. And it's, all, it's like me having a new patient all the time. Yeah. So it's it's that it's electricity in your brain, right? So it's it 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 was magnificent to see those changes, right? Again, I think the current steering really changed a lot. But okay, yeah. enough of that. Um, let's talk about the top three things that you may see in changes in your communication. And again, um, we're not going to get too much into where where you're going to get things placed. That's a the conversation with the doctor. But if you're coming in with certain kind of communication issues, the doctor may pick one area or the other. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to look at how do we address slurring, how do we address low volume, and then fluency. And fluency kind of covers two rounds, but I'm going to get into the word binding. So again, this slurred or garbled speech is really the most uh, DBS influence component and it can happen a couple different ways. I mean again the vocal folds are, are innervated by structures that are right up below where the STN leads are and so it's it's doable it's possible that those leads are producing too much current and as a result you might be able to um, you might be able to modify the programming for that. And then the other placement is the globus pallidus pars interna. It's a much bigger structure and that means that it needs a lot more current and that can sometimes lead to some bleeding into the internal capsule which will change a different kind of uh, stimulation. So the long and short of, uh, of this is that if you're dealing with this issue uh, speech therapy may help you push through it to be louder but I would as a speech therapist I would say what can you do with the programming to influence this first because it'll be a lot easier just like you were saying different person every two weeks after the first the first couple programming sessions after your dbs you know first one they're just setting the levels and seeing what your tolerances are and they're going to put you somewhere right in the middle so you'll have to do that for a little while anyways and that's why i'm saying if you have this problem see if you can program your way out of it before you try to therapy your way out of it um, and again, this may be a situation in, in certain individuals where you have a program that's for a lot of activity, and then you have a program that's for sitting around and talking, and, and you're not going to be moving around as much, and you get more benefit for your voice by turning something down, and maybe you get more benefit for your movement capacity by turning it back up. And all the devices have a, some kind of remote that has some parameters. You can't, like... You, you can't program it into the deep settings or anything like that, but your doctor can agree on a couple settings with you and you can toggle them on and off. And actually, the Abbott has an iPhone app, which I think is awesome. 
anyways, um, so that's one possibility. I want to just really show this very quickly, this directional DBS. This is part of the Boston Scientific when they were getting their uh, FDA approvals. So this is part of their study coming up there. But what's interesting, is if you look at this lead, the red is the stimulation. And normally, you put the lead in there, and the stimulation comes all the way around the entire you want to put a little thing? Okay, I can do it here. I'll, I'll go ahead and put a little something here so you can see it. It's good. Yeah. So let me use my laser pointer. So this red right here, you see this? This is the target that they're putting it into, and they put the leads into a certain level, and then they would turn on the stimulation. And in the older devices, that stimulation would be a little ball. It would just be all through here, and so that means you're getting directional. You're, you're getting um, stimulation in all directions. It's going here, it's going out, it's going around. And with this Boston Scientific and now the Abbott, they can actually turn off a side of it. So this blue means that's off, and it allows them to preferentially stimulate what you're looking, what you're trying to stimulate without necessarily getting other structures. And in this, this is a case study. So this is a single individual. Um, is it turn it back off or? Okay. Yeah, I'll leave it on here. Um, this individual needed to get to uh, a certain level of of stimulation to get what they call their therapeutic window, their, their stimulation that provides the movement related, the speed and the reducing the rigidity. And so that was a problem because they needed to get to 3.2 milliamps and they could start seeing problems with this R3 at 2.9, but they were able to change the stimulation so they turned off that one section here in the blue and all of a sudden they could go up to 5.0 milliamps, which gives them a lot of headroom, gives them some room so as they're changing things over the years and the Parkinson's changes. So that's a perfect example of this and there's, there's hundreds more but this is the case study that I've ever seen in Milan and it caught my attention back then and it still does now. Um, a low volume, that's another uh, uh, really common problem and you can do some strengthening exercises, you can do anything you can to add more um, more communication into your day-to-day -day routine. Ben was kind of talking about how he yells. I mean, again, that's where you would use an LSVT. And the thing is that LSVT, Lee Silverman voice therapy, or other high-intensity, high-amplitude speech approaches like Speak Out or pitch-limited voice therapy or whatever else is out there, um, it's the gold standard for traditional Parkinson's, and this is a study that where they did it on individuals who um, had DBS. And the results were kind of what I've noticed, which is it's not always fixable with, with therapy. That's why you would work with the therapist and then hopefully work on the programming because sometimes, I think I think if it's five out of 11, I, I, I remember this study when it was going on Dr. Klepitskaya at the University of Colorado and um, uh, spoke on this topic a couple times, but I don't, I don't know that it's gonna always work Work, and that's just because if your volume changes are due to uh, not having enough breath support or something like that because of the stimulation, it's going to be hard to get around that, and that's where programming might come into play. But it's definitely worth doing, and it's definitely worth maintaining a vocal exercise program. It's one of the reasons why we continue to do the speech and communication program on Tuesdays with the IPDMDC because we want to make sure you always continue your exercise. And then this gets back to the, the research we were talking about before. This is probably the only area where I, I would say we consistently see changes after DBS, and they are very mild. They're just barely um, uh, statistically significant, but they're there, and it's just a situation where you might have a hard time pulling up the words on the fly, and it's going to have some more pauses when you're talking. It's basically a kind of a Parkinson's problem already, and this may exacerbate it a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say that stimulation is going to be the, the, the key here. I don't think that's going to be the way you fix it. You're going to be integrating uh, the tools that we would tell people who are dealing with it already. So you're going to be using communication techniques like talking around a problem. So if you're trying to talk in on a bus, you know, it's the, the public transportation. And we're like, oh, you mean the bus. Okay, you'll do that, you'll crowdsource it. People in, in, the, in the conversation that you're talking with may help provide some information. And sometimes you might find, like, well, I can't remember her name, but we'll come back to that. And it usually does come back. But sometimes you find that you're in the conversation and it comes back, you're like, well, it's no longer relevant and you've moved on already. What you don't want to do is let it cause you strain and concern and anxiety. This is another thing where the same situation where DBS because of the changes in, in, in 
balance may have an influence on dual task. Yeah, going in line with what we were saying, it's just this um there's a direct relationship. If you feel unsafe, yeah, I'm sure you you your focus, the brain will be focusing on keeping us always safe when we're in the standing position. So the talking will be compromised. And sometimes people say things quicker, so they might increase their speed uh, their speech so they can get the conversation done until they so they can feel safer. Like even if you're close to a wall, you feel safer than just in an open space. If you are dealing with balance issues, right? So this is um, that relationship between me. If I'm able to, for example, talk and walk at the same time, and this is a, an identified problem in as we get older and more severely in Parkinson's disease. And that goes in line with the tip that I was saying earlier. You might want to um, consider if, you, if the person is in a standing position and doing some sort of activity, when is the right moment for me to talk? Well, <coughs> Sorry. It's okay. Anything to add there? No, okay, very good. Feel, feel free to hydrate. Um. <laughs> it's it's actually because related to the fact that I'm turning to talk, yeah. and so it places me in a, in a less advantage. Restricting <laughs> it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And then, now the next thing you can do is have an assessment with the neurologist, especially if they're the one doing the programming or the person who does the programming at the clinic with you. And that's, you know, the initial sessions, again, after you get your leads placed and they turn them on, the first session or two, they're kind of seeing what you can tolerate and what turns into, into difficulties. But as you go along, you'll want to go ahead and continue to try to, to tweak things. And again, Parkinson's will continue to progress. And so when you see something changing, speak up about it because they'll probably have something they can do to address it. Um, I think this is always good uh, to get a formal assessment for for any kind of risk that you might have. This is something that hopefully, if you're working with an interdisciplinary Parkinson's team that has a movement disorder specialist and the surgeon and the physio and the speech and the occupational and the neuropsych, all those people in, the, in this group that you're going to be working with, hopefully speech is part of this, particularly if someone's coming in with a speech issue already, that's something that I would let the doctor know. It's like, okay, I'm already worried about some issues here. And the neuropsychologist may say, well, I'm worried about these issues with fluency and stuff like that. And together, that helps the doctor say, oh, hey, we're going to probably look at a GPI versus an STN, or there's a lot of dyskinesia, so we're definitely going to do a GPI, or whatever you're going to do. Getting this assessment with an SLP uh, will help you well, help them communicate better with the doctor so they know what's going on. And that, again, it's 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 a lot of variables. This is why, again, I really think you should work with a team that has has all those people on there so that you can get the input. I, I'm not a, not as comfortable with people who are working with just a surgeon. I think that's a little harder to do. Okay, then you want to stay up to date on changes in DBS care because, again, um, this comes from that same survey from Parkinson's Europe. If you know what's going on, and particularly some of the changes, and again, in the past 10 years, there's been the closed loop, there's been a sleep DBS, there's been advances in the way things are programmed and in the way that they can, they can provide the stimulation. It's very, it's very amazing what's going on. It's happening so much faster than I ever thought it would. So stay up to date on that because there might be new options. And again, Brian is a perfect example of that. He went in with Abbott, the entire system, and now he has Abbott in the leads and Boston Scientific in the battery, and that's providing him with a really good uh, outcome, and I think that's, well, a better outcome, and I think that's valuable. So we're just going to summarize it here. We're going to leave a little bit of room for people to ask questions here. You know, the, the one thing is knowing what is a problem you know, having your own impression of what it should sound like, what difficulties you're having communication, whether you're isolating and also getting the input from your family and your spouse. Mm -hmm. Formal assessments, you know, from the neurologist for sure, but obviously with a speech language pathologist, I would say if we weren't talking about communication today, I, I, most people I know who undergo DBS end up doing a little bit of work on balance afterwards with a physio. Um, recognizing the other aspects of Parkinson's that may influence things. And again, your doctor is going to be aware of this and they're going to make decisions on how they're doing the surgery, where they're doing the surgery, what tool they're using uh, based on that. And then recognizing kind of the more common issues. Again, the addressable ones. Yeah, I, w I, w I would share with you that it's amazing uh, to be working with someone and then to realize that they don't, they are not informed 
that maybe depression can actually be worsened after and apathy. And so the person is just not feeling themselves and they, they're not aware that this could be a complication. And to just say, you really need to urgently talk with your neurologist and change the settings because there's a solution for that, right? Uh, so I think uh, doing programs like this and, and helping people understand the useful information because obviously we're concerned about giving too much information and it doesn't really it, turn into something practical. But um, so we hope you, you got some key messages from this and um, yeah, keeping updated is a good example is this type of tools. <laughs> you, you know, there, and I could have put a slide in here, there's actually a, a, an app out there that um, is for people with the closed loop system. It's a group called uh, Rune Labs mm -hmm. and Stripe PD and if you had the closed loop DBS, which capturing the signal, it actually communicates with the app and provides stuff. So that's, again, it's an innovation that was not there before. You can hit it right there, I think. Yeah. You can just capture anybody who wants to talk. So does, does anyone have any questions they would like us to answer? Anyone have to talk about an issue that did or didn't work? The, Sonia brought something up here I just want to mention. Someone said if they had metal in their in their brain, metal in their head, could they have DBS? And they do a lot of imaging through MRI initially, and so sometimes it's hard. So that would probably be someone who couldn't do it. They would have to look at, you know, another option, maybe focus ultrasound or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, I see someone yeah. trying to mute there. Yeah, I go for you. I can, I can help you. If I can find there, you're right. I, a button should come up for you. See it there? Yeah. There you got it. Um, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. And, uh, you know, Artemio had DBS, and I think um, maybe we were not that aware of things that might happen after DBS. And uh, so the first month was very uh, terrifying, <laughs> let's say, in the sense that uh, it was not directly with the uh, the surgery as a for one issue, but uh, the, it was mostly the withdrawal symptoms he had from not taking the medicines. Uh, and specifically, Asilect and Meribex. Um, yeah. They they would Meribex in particular. The withdrawal symptoms from Meribex were awful, horrendous, for about a month. And then my body stabilized. Yeah, especially but it's something to be aware of. Yeah, especially no, not not sleeping properly. I mean, he couldn't sleep, and that uh, his a uh, level of anxiety and depression that now we can know that it's part of the surgery. I think that uh, combined was the first month was a little bit uh, 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 complicated. So the good quality of life issue there is. I no longer take any of those two medications. I'm only on retiring. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's an interesting thing because the Mirapex in particularly is a, is, a, is a dopamine agonist and sometimes it can, it can feel very um, good to take something like that. And so it, you, when you don't have it, I can see where it can throw your system off. This is one of these things where DBS is providing a certain level of stimulation, but it's not at all like taking a pill and getting that up that down. Yeah. Ben, ben talks about this in, in, a, in an interview where he does that. And so, yes, yeah, so it's a very good point. Uh, congratulations, just right, Tari, which is a, a nice extended release formulation of carbidopa levodopa. That's excellent. And I'll, and I'll keep you posted on my dealings with the FAA on getting the medical certificate for continuing to fly. Yeah, he, he uh, Artemio is hoping to become a pilot again or re return back to the skies. And I think that's a really great story. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'll keep so. you posted. Yeah, no, I know you will. I know you will. <laughs> the other minor thing, well, it wasn't that minor, but uh, uh, Artemio had a pulmonary um, uh, embolism. embolism, yes. And uh, and they say that uh, maybe he didn't walk enough or whatever. Dr. Rogers at the end told us that's part of the risks of any surgery, especially brain surgery. So, uh but uh, luckily, it was addressed very, very quickly, so there were no, uh, no, uh, no issues after that. But, uh, but as a partner, I see him another person. He, he really is another person. Oh. Uh, he, uh, he does things that, uh, again, that he used to do before, and uh, the quality of life for both of us, for the family and, and overall, has been incredible. So. 
even with a little, you know, a uh, little rocks in the road there, uh, it was, uh, it's well worth it. The quality of life has, in, has shot off through the roof. It, initially, it went down, and, and it shot off all the way up. I think there's two things. First of all, you are a force of nature, Art. We knew that already. And uh, but <laughs> but I'll say this: the key message for everyone listening here is that if things aren't working well, get to the doctor and talk about it, and know that there are solutions. And that's the really big one. And I'm really glad to hear about the rest of it. But um, hang, yeah, hang tight, hang, hang hang tight, and don't give up because it, the uh, the lights at the end of the tunnel. Okay, and then uh, Don, you put something. Yeah, good. Yeah, she put something in there. Uh, Don, I will say that your doctor, question. He, his question was about uh, dealing with another uh, is, issue with cancer that may, may be something. I have a feeling that you should still talk to a doctor and see what the options are, but they'll probably want to address one before the other. And I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm have my own biases. But I'd say that when you are looking for a DVS physician, and again, Sonia put the link in for uh, ANOVA, I think you definitely want to work with a movement disorder specialist and a surgeon. I don't. I wouldn't go just to a solo surgeon. I think you you need to have the the full team on there, and that's the only thing I see that anymore. And I'm, I know that not everyone believes that, but that's my bias, and I've said it, and I'm not taking it back. I believe. It. And it's usually the neurologist movement disorder that that uh, has that conversation with you. Yeah. And that uh, knows your case and knows if you're a good candidate or not. Yeah. Um, and then they'll refer to the to the surgeon. Uh, yeah. So I, I, do people go directly to the surgeon? I, I don't. There are certain. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in Europe, but there are certain yeah. practices that are only surgeons. They're, they're neurosurgeons, so they're qualified, but they don't work with a mood disorder specialist. And I, that used to not ever be the case. It's more common now, and I'm saying I'm biased. I don't like that. Okay. I want I want a mood disorder specialist mm -hmm. and a neurosurgeon, and they usually know each other. And I'm sorry I'm biased, but I don't mm -hmm. care because I believe it. So yeah. I said it. That's, it's it's yeah. defined. It's best practice. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. It's possible to do it the other ways, though, but I, I, I'm mm -hmm. just saying that I think that an MDS will also know. Like, mm -hmm. with cancer treatment, there may be certain agents that may have an influence on your Parkinson's. Uh, there may yeah. be something you're taking for nausea that actually blocks dopamine in its action, and that's where a movement disorder specialist is going to have that down, and maybe a neurosurgeon might not. Mm -hmm. So, okay. But, yeah, hopefully that helps you, and, and do look for a good movement disorder specialist. And I, I think what I can share from my experience is, what was happening in all those years that I, that I saw a lot of DVS going wrong uh, is probably we were we didn't have enough knowledge about who to do it with. So the inclusion criteria have become more rigorous, and so I think when people are really well selected, it goes really well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I, I would uh, be assessing people before they went, and people would be like, "No, I have to be on my best behavior to pass." And I said, "You don't want to pass a test." <laughs> In a negative way, right? I will so it's help like you cheat. If if uh, you are not a good candidate, it's good that we don't know that we know that we know that you're not a good candidate, right? Yeah. Uh, because then those are the situations that would go less good. So, the person with a pacemaker candidate for DBS. Yeah, I, uh, I, you'll have to manage it a little bit more carefully, but for certain, because cardiac versus brain. Yeah, so it's definitely doable. I, I've even seen people who have other kind of uh, stimulators and they, they can do it. That's a doctor question, so you'll have to figure out your own solution. But, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's doable for sure. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, the one is if other stuff in the brain, like I said, Sony was talking about someone who had metal there, that'll, that'll limit their ability to do the right kind of imaging to be able to understand. So that'll be a different problem. But, uh, you know, Below, you know, south of the collarbone, I think you're probably not looking at much. How about how about uh, in the neck? I've got a lot of vertebrae, vertebrae been uh, molded by vet, uh, vet doctors. Did you have an anterior cervical dissection infusion? Then you had an ACDF in the rear of the, head, the rear of the spine. Did they come through the front or did they do it in the back? Back. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I still think that it's possible. I, I, I want to be more cautious with that because usually, like like Brian's perfect example, he had the DVS and then he had the ACDF. But I, I think it's very doable, and that that surgery, that cervical fusion, is pretty common. So I, I would imagine. Okay. Thank but you. Just ask the doctor, but just to make sure I don't. I'm a speech therapist. I don't want to get out of my own. I want to swim in some other plane. So yeah, good. One final follow-on question, please. I've had. 
two sessions with a wonderful speech therapist at the University of Virginia. And he's encouraged me from time to time to not be a stranger and follow up with that. Is this something I should do now before I investigate any further on on deep brain stimulation or just work the DBS first? I, I think uh, the model that we always talk about now is the dental model. So I think you want to see that SLP that you've got a good relationship with and knows you. Okay. See them on a regular uh, occasion and then talk with the DBS surgeon about how you're going to go about that surgery and and keep that SLP involved in it. I think um, it can be helpful sometimes to get a nice picture before. So that, that tells me this is what we want when we're done. And you know, it won't be exactly the same, but it gives me a much better levels. So yes, I think you, may, you maintain that relationship with that person, especially if, if, you, if you're working with them well, you like them. Thank right? you. Yeah, no, thank you. Good questions. Oh, good. Uh, this is another person who had surgery with Dr. Shanai at, uh, at uh, IPNBC. It was a life-changing event. I'm very happy. Uh, in the first month after initial program, I was off the meds completely. And that's, that's a, uh, not as common as it should be, but it's great. I, uh, I worked for Davis Finney, who was an Olympic athlete with Parkinson. And he went off meds entirely afterwards. Um, there are some people that may do a different version of the DBS where it won't change the meds, but it will provide other kind of benefits. So if you do STN, it's one of the benefits is you generally reduce the meds by at least 40, 50, 60 percent or in this woman's in, in, in situation entirely, which is amazing. Congratulations. I'm glad you had a great outcome. And we hope for that. Does anyone else have any questions? I know we've gone a little bit over like we tend to do a little bit. Everything we have here will be available on the ipmdc.org website. We always put the recording and the slides are available so you can refer back to them. Yeah, it's only put it right there and there. And then if you catch up with Sonia, you can we can always get questions afterwards too. But we're here every month. We'll actually be here next week for another program. So you can ask us anytime. Okay. All right. We hope it was useful. Thank you for we coming hope in. to see you soon. All right. Take care. See you, Art. You. See you in the skies, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.